Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very eminent, senior, and respected doctor from Mumbai, India, Dr. Tapan Saikia. Dr. Saikia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saikia is uh, a director of Oncosciences, a senior consultant of medical oncology at Just Look Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. He's a visiting professor and senior consultant of medical oncology at the State Cancer Institute, GMCH in Guwahati. And he's the chief of medical oncology at PAHHNCII in Mumbai. So Dr. Saikia, tell me about your own amazing journey and what motivated you to specialize in oncology? May not be amazing, but uh, it's probably a little interesting. Yeah. Um, to begin with, where I was born, I was born in a small town. We mm -hmm. always call it half town, half village. Okay. A small town in Assam, in eastern part, called Naharkatia, in a tea garden. Father used to work there. Mm -hmm. And then um, journey started there, went to a school, did my schooling, uh, taking science. Mm -hmm. And from my uh, school straight away, I went to medical college. Mm -hmm. It was not very far from home, about 30 miles away, Assam Medical College, Debruga, did my graduation, post-graduation in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And after internal medicine, um, I thought I had not learned enough of medicine wow. to practice <laughs> or starting a, a mm -hmm. job somewhere. I mm -hmm. thought I should uh, learn something more. And that's the way oncology happened. No, oh, wow. A friend guided, why don't you try if you're interested in oncology in Tata Memorial Hospital? Mm. Probably at that point of time, 1981, there were two or three cancer hospitals in Correct. the country. Correct. I wrote to the director, fortunate. Director sent me within a month uh, an appointment later. Come here, join us as a senior registrar. Mm. I came in. And the idea was that I would get trained for about six months, one year, go back home, and then probably do some oncology. Fantastic. Um, that's destiny. Providence <laughs> didn't happen that way. <laughs> I know. And as they say, the rest is history. Right. A couple of years ago, <laughs> the line uh, had said, it, stay back, stay back. One Friday afternoon said, Monday morning, you joined the faculty. So, Dr. <laughs> so yeah. so, Sakya, over the years, how has the approach to cancer care evolved during your career? It, it changed a lot. Yeah. I think that's a complete change. Mm -hmm. um, when we came into oncology, there was very little happening in oncology, but it was beginning to happen. Mm -hmm. 1981, we knew about a few important things, the molecular biology that exploded in mid-70s. Mm -hmm. The early 80s became popular in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Also about the monoclonal antibodies that's so important now for diagnostics in every branch of medicine, and therapeutics. And the great thing about that monoclonal antibodies is that uh, the persons who got Nobel Prize, Cola and Milstein, they never patented it. Mm. They kept it open. Okay. So it's free for everyone to do it. And that's why it has been possible to, you know, the one kind of things happening in the field of uh, cancer or any other medicine. Mm. 1981 was the beginning. And at the same time, the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in US. Right. So three important things happened when I went into oncology. And those basic biology that we understood at that point of time, born fruit in the later part of 90s. It takes mm -hmm. about 15 years to see there's some therapeutics coming in. So everything changed towards the end of the millennium. Mm -hmm. And what we practiced in 1981, some are still there. Basic surgery, radiation, mm -hmm. my field, medical oncology. But that's important pillar. Based yeah. on that, huge differences have come. We practice oncology in a different way, mm. look at it a different way. Uh, we can understand the disease better, prognosticate better, treatment, of course, beyond chemotherapy now. Right, very well said. And uh, doctor, you know, uh, cancer is something which everyone seems to be scared of, the big C, as it is often referred to by non-medical people. What common misconceptions about cancer do you encounter uh, when you treat a lot of people? And how do you address these misconceptions? So it's life-changing. A diagnosis of cancer, there is no question about that because so much of uncertainty comes in the moment it's diagnosed. 
important is early detection. Any cancer that is detected early, majority will get out, get rid of the disease and live a normal life. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen because cancer might hide somewhere. It takes its own time to grow. By the time you get some symptoms, probably it has started growing a large, a large tumor in that area and started spreading to the other parts. Mm. Um, so by that time, we call it advanced stage. So treatment changes from uh, local treatment of surgery or radiation, mm. plus minus chemotherapy. But now you just think about how to control the disease give a better quality of life. Hmm. Misconception, people still, people do understand better, but people come with, it's a the end of my life. Right. Many people, even if it's an early uh, diagnosis. Hmm. So that needs time to sit down with a person, discuss about it. Hmm. Misconception, more from the patient's families, because they are so much worried. Hmm. I think their vision gets blurred. Hmm. The patient himself wants, or herself, wants to get out of it. Right. Often they are positive, but the family members would tell us, please don't tell the diagnosis. Mm. I said that, well, I I respect your what you think, but let me handle it my way. Mm. I, I will talk to the person in such a way that the, he or she comes out very positive to fight the disease. Mm. So misconception remains because people talk, and after talking, you know, they don't know whom to trust. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you. My next question, uh, sir, is uh, what is the most important thing a cancer patient should focus on uh, during treatment? And I'm not referring to any medical terminologies at all because I wouldn't know how to ask you a question on that. It, it's probably how we start our discussion right. and take it forward. I think mm -hmm. first day, first meeting is the most important thing. We must give enough amount of time. Mm -hmm. And as oncologists, our job is to stay positive, even the patient has a very advanced disease. Mm. Maybe just palliative care or the curative treatment. So understand the person's mind, body language, even family members sitting down for a long period of time is very important. I think that meeting changes everything. If we are negative, everything goes down in a negative path. But if you are positive, patient, at the end of it, I try to see that patient goes out to the sm smile mm -hmm. and says a sentence himself or herself, say that, good that I, I'm happy that I came here. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's probably the focus uh, remains in my mind all yeah. that time. Very true, very true. You're so right. Uh, and can you also, for my viewers and listeners, help us understand how does lifestyle impact cancer risk and what preventive measures can be taken? Uh, it's a complex mechanism, as it happens, because as a human, we developed over millions of years. We have so much more to understand how different uh, tissues and cells are interacting, how we are look, seeing things, how we're smelling things, talking, understanding, reacting, etc. So, but getting, you know, we understand a little bit better than before now. Mm. Um, Lifestyle, definitely, the sedentary lifestyle that we have settled down to now, that leads to mm. change of metabolism in our body. We, we gain weight more than what it should be. And obesity, obesity sets in a uh, path for developing diabetes, kidney diseases, hypertension, right. uh, things like that. And they, like diseases like diabetes, sets in an inflammatory condition in the body. It's very quietly. And this inflammatory condition leads to behave the cells and the normal cells in an abnormal way. So a sedentary lifestyle, kind of food that we eat, um, like oil. Oil probably was not there for human beings to mm -hmm. ingest because if you, oil and water never mixes. Mm. And everything is made in oil now. Mm. Uh, whether it's a refined oil, it's a pure oil, or adulterated oil. I suppose that things have changed in the last uh, 100 years or so. Our habit has completely changed. Mm. So lifestyle disease, smoking definitely contributes to it. We know mm. few cancers, alcohol does. Beyond that, whether any particular food is responsible, that has been difficult to really establish the relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there is one uh, relationship, but it's very dynamic. What you eat at the age of three or four or eight years 
probably shows up when you are 40 or 50. So true. So I think that kind of relationship is a long, longitudinal work to do, uh, start working. Um, okay. People are working, some they will understand better that mm. how every foot leads to some kind of illness. What a great response, sir. Thank you. Can you also talk a little bit, sir, about uh, some of the latest advances, advancements in cancer treatment and how are they changing patient outcomes? Uh, starting with surgery, because that was the first thing to happen in the field of cancer. Um, surgery has changed uh, now that people do as little as possible, what you call minimally invasive surgery. So extensive surgeries are, whenever it's possible, avoid it. People from open surgery, people have gone on to now laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, image-guided surgery. So surgery has definitely changed. Mm -hmm. So they remove only the tumor tissue and the surroundings as much as needed. Mm -hmm. so people are getting trained for that. Then came radiation oncology. This is over generations of medicine, um, radiation machines have been developed. Mm -hmm. It's developing there, starting mm -hmm. from the cobalt or deep X-ray, which was about 60, 70 years ago. Then moved on now, moving on to something called proton. Not that everybody need, needs proton therapy, but that's one of the latest advances. Coming to our own branch called medical oncology, there was chemotherapy started after the Second World War, mm -hmm. continued like this in the 80s, 90s. As I did mention in the beginning, mm -hmm. we started understanding the biology of the disease. Mm -hmm. so people in the academic institutes, in the industry started working to develop newer drugs, new molecules, uh, against uh, called monoclonal antibodies. These have been developed, so that is immunotherapy. And people also understood at the molecular level what might be the driving the disease. Mm -hmm. So we call it a driver mutation. Mm -hmm. You need to develop a drug against it. So these are called targeted drugs mm -hmm. or small molecules. Mm -hmm. So some drugs are given intravenously, some can be given oral. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, we are focusing in addition to chemotherapy, wherever we can bring in these small molecules or mm. immunotherapy. So last decade has been the time of small molecules as well as immunotherapy in cancer. Thank you, sir. And uh, so what would you say are some of the big challenges in cancer treatment that are still uh, currently being addressed? The first is that early detection. Mm. That has become very important. In Western countries, it's it has happened. You know, go to France, every woman will get a mammography done at the right age. Mm -hmm. Go to UK, go to Canada, it happens, many of the Western countries. So early picking up disease, breast cancer, which is the commonest cancer across the world, any country, no country has been spared by this disease. So early diagnosis, early detection, guiding the person to go to the right hospital. So mm -hmm. there's Availability of the system is very important. Mm. Uh, you know, a country like India, it's still a challenge, like cervical cancer or breast mm. cancer. You can screen, diagnose it, after that, suspect it first. Mm. And guiding that person to the hospital is a big challenge. So there is a lack of a bridge mm. between the screening, suspecting something, and taking the person to the hospital, convincing someone to go. Mm. That bridge needs to be developed. Important thing is that from uh, early detection of cancer and treating as early as possible. Of mm -hmm. course, advanced cancers still pose a lot of challenge to us. They're improving, but giving an example of lung cancer, um, about 20 years ago, five years survival was only 2%. Now it has moved up to 25%. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump, but still we have to cover the rest of the 75%. So advanced cancer still remains a challenge for all of mm, us. Mm, very interesting. And uh, given the onset of so much technology, especially technology like artificial intelligence, how is these things beginning to impact uh, work in the area of oncology? Uh, it's beginning in diagnostics, definitely. There is no question about it. Mm -hmm. Because massive data goes in and the computer processes with a massive amount of data comes up with kind of answer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's radiologists are already using it. Mm -hmm. uh, pathologists are also beginning to use it. Uh, for radiology, one example, again, breast cancer comes in. Um, recently, some papers were published that uh, it's better than uh, routinely screening procedures for uh, breast cancer. 
better than your mammography, better than MRI. That's because of the data that goes in from an individual AI analyzer comes up with an answer. Mm -hmm. it has not become a routine practice, but looks like it will work. Similarly in treatment, but that will take a bit of time. Um, you know, leukemia that I treat, that's my specialty. Um, artificial intelligence started coming in quite some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, getting the molecular information, then a learning objective, then going to validate it and comes up. So diagnostics will help us to classify the disease better. Then once you classify the disease, we understand who, which class of disease will be good risk, right. poor risk, then accordingly going in. So artificial intelligence will be part of our life mm. uh, in, in coming decade. And that will stay with us for sure. That is so true. So one more question related to oncology, and then I want to move to your mantras. Uh, how do you, uh, sir, approach discussing treatment options and prognosis with patients and their families? Yes, now things have changed in the last uh, 10 years or so. Earlier, there were, uh, we used to treat the protocol, we used to call it a couple of treatment protocols, we discussed this or that. Mm. Now that with explosion of knowledge, treatment algorithms are changing. So now, most professional societies are coming in. Uh, for example, uh, ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology. Mm. There is URTC, European Organization of Treatment and Research in Cancer, then NCCN from US, National Cancer Care Network. Mm. Those uh, experts sit down or discuss about every disease, um, classification, pathology, treatment. So these guidelines have become very important to sit down with patients' treatment options open. Mm. So I think every patient we treat now, uh, treatable cases, we sit down and discuss about that. This is the way the world is treating. Uh, we do have available uh, uh, technologies in the country. We can go ahead. Times, I may not have that kind of facilities in my hospital. I guide people to go to another center, that it, this hospital is best, expertise, infrastructure. So uh, that's the way we start and take it forward. Fantastic. So now I'm going to move to your mantras. You know, when I was reading about you, I was fascinated. You have such amazing mantras. So I'm going to pick up a few of your mantras and ask you to help us understand this. Your first mantra that I was fascinated was, somebody up there likes me. <laughs> and my question is, how does faith or a sense of destiny play a role in your work with cancer patients? Yes. Uh, first thing about... How I start, where, how and when I started using this phrase. Mm -hmm. I was very young, maybe fifth standard, went to see a movie, a morning show in our place, uh -huh. Sunday morning, called uh, Somebody Up There Likes Me. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, a boxer from New York, uh, Rocky Graziano, mm -hmm. and the uh, boxer, the actor was Paul Newman. And at that age, I was 10 years old. The effect technique meant the man who was, goes for boxing, street fighting, winning some, losing mm -hmm. some, but mm -hmm. kept on coming back mm -hmm. and then becoming, becoming a winner. So that's remained in my mind for a long period of time. Then in personal life, then it happens that you are given some awards. So you think about it, do I deserve it personally? Mm -hmm. I don't. If I do, there are tens and thousands of other doctors also deserve. Right. So I have to give a speech when I'm accepting acceptance speech. I say, yeah. Somebody up there likes me. That's why I was chosen for the award. Mm. This is uh, for my personal life. In patients, I always take them, you know, people are religious here in this country. Everyone is so religious. So I think uh, I talk about that, think, uh, consider their religion, start talking about it. Mm. This is the time that this art is testing you at this point of time. So you've got to trust, take it forward. Uh, we are there as a team to help you. So I use this phrase in my regular practice that um, patients develop their trust so that they can take appropriate treatment. Fascinating. So your next one that I was again fascinated was with was life after the last bus stop. And my question to you is how do you guide patients and their families through the journey yes. of a terminal illness? <laughs> So again, again, my personal, how I, why you use this phrase, mm -hmm. uh, from home, 
to coming to the college, we stayed in a hostel. There was a private bus, we used to call light bus. So get at the last stop, then you go to the hostel. I said, how would I travel? Because my life starts from there. So everything that I do, I said, it after my life, after the last bus stop. Uh, for patients, terminal, um, it's a bit challenging in our country yeah. because um, families are concerned, person doesn't want to know, but there are people, you know, I saw someone yesterday, um, his Ramadan is on, he knows what happened. He mm. says, how many days? Mm. I said, I told him that God tells this month you should be around. Mm. Uh, we need you, your family needs you. Mm. So ca coming uh, absolutely clearly asking about it, there are very few people mm. in this country. We, we do it uh, through patients' families. And then um, what we need when I do not sever the umbilical cord, but we bring in our palliative care team. Mm. Because they are so compassionate and so nice. The physician in palliative care team, the nurse, the social worker, they know the language they should speak with the patient and families. So it's a teamwork again. Um, someone very close suffering from it. One, um, I talk, uh, keep talking, staying positive. When the time comes, stay with them. Uh, it's it's a it's not easy. It's not very not easy, but we have to do it. Mm. And someone will have to do it. So for palliative care, I try not to shy away. So if I stay in touch uh, whenever they can come to the hospital, but most frequently we communicate through telephone calls, mm -hmm. but uh, also through our WhatsApp. WhatsApp is so popular in India mm. and it helps a lot. Mm. Interesting. The next one is uh, act, don't react. How can this mantra be applied in the decision-making process uh, when you're treating somebody? We all react, react all the time. Someone says something, something we see, immediately we say something or do something. Uh, I read, it, it was in again Times of India, they have a small space, they call it. So a number of years ago, it's maybe 25 years ago, this came and then I cut it and kept it in my book. And I say it, and it, this is so important. I keep, we keep reacting all the time. And we look back and say that I could have acted in a different way. Mm. So reaction does happen. And then I analyze myself that what I said was right or wrong. Mm. If I feel it's wrong, I start the conversation again. So let's start in a different way. Mm. Sometimes we lose our temper. Mm. It happens so human beings. So I, I, rather than going away from that, I try to get back to that person, say that this has happened. Um, uh, so acting has mindful. I've become you know, very mindful about it. It's happening every daily. It happens reactions, mm. but again, uh, acting. So when I don't want to react, I'm conscious that I, I'm not supposed to react. I need time. Give me five minutes, half an hour, two hours. Mm. And I think what would be the best response Fascinating. So I have time for two more questions, sir, for you. My next question is another mantra, which is no one is perfect. And I wanted to ask you, how has this mantra shaped your approach to continuous learning and improvement? So as a child in the school, I think that every, I thought that everyone should be thinking same. Why people are thinking differently? Hmm. That's that. So you make your talk hmm. and a child will think that, you know, everyone should, we should play hmm. together go to school together, <laughs> eat together, but realize that coming to college, when there were 150 students, everyone was different. We were in a dorm of 18 boys together. So then I decided, I wrote on the, on the wall, no one is perfect. Mm. So whenever a friend comes and starts talking to me, I mm. said, I'm not perfect, he's not perfect. Why should I judge him? Mm. So mm. It, 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 it remains applicable uh, in my uh, professional uh, Days also, uh, life. Uh, person comes in. I know that every individual will be different. The person afflicted with the disease, mm. their relatives, friends, and I need to understand each and every one, and then uh, do what I can do best for that uh, person and the family. Mm. So. Fascinating. And my last question to you, sir: How do you balance the scientific rigor of oncology? 
with the compassionate care uh, required by your mantras? Uh, it's experience. When I came in, probably I was uh, different. Though it helped me because I uh, came all the way from Assam, so I had to stay in the um, hospital itself, 24 by 7. I couldn't get away from the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's why I probably had a big department got me there. Mm -hmm. He told someone that he's from Assam, where will he go? He has no friends or families here. So that worked out very well. He supported me all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, talking to people, becoming friendly, not thinking that patient is a patient, someone coming to me, mm. is one of the uh, community, one of the family. When patients are upset, starts crying, I tell them, we are family now. Mm. And I am doctor, you are patient. I don't think that way. Mm. So let's work together for management of your disease. Um, that that has that mantra uh, seems to be working quite well. Mm. Very interesting. And on that note, uh, Dr. Sekia, thank you so much for speaking to me. I think I've learned so many new things from you on oncology. But what was what has struck me even more is your mantras. You know the the wisdom that you have in these mantras is something which I think each one of us can learn, not just from what you have said relating to life and oncology, but this applies as much to the corporate world and young, old, uh, or anybody else in this world for that matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for speaking to me and good luck to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.